I said last time that we were going to move into Newton's second law by talking about free body diagrams, FBDs. But in thinking about that one, I realized that we should first introduce the four named forces that we'll encounter this semester. These are forces that are unique enough and show up often enough that it's convenient to give them names. I'll list them here and then we'll talk about them each in turn. The first one is the weight. That's the gravitational force acting on an object. Then we have a force that we'll call tension. Then there's the normal force. And last we have friction. All right, so let's go back and talk about each of these briefly in turn. Weight is the gravitational force acting on something. Now let's suppose that we have an object in free fall. It could be a box or a ball or whatever, but the important thing is that there's only one force acting on it, and it's the force due to gravity pulling the object straight down. So here's our object. I'll draw it as a baseball. And we know from what we did before that if gravity is the only thing acting on this object, then its acceleration is going to be straight down. So we have an acceleration ay equals minus g. I can also write this as the acceleration vector has a magnitude of g and a direction straight down along the negative y axis. So when I come to Newton's second law, which tells me to add up all the forces on an object and set it equal to mass times acceleration, in this case, we only have one force. It's the force due to gravity that's giving us this acceleration. So I'm going to call that F sub G, the force of gravity. You can also call it the weight force, W. Many books will call it either or both of those. And we can set it equal to MA. Now I know what the acceleration is in this case. I know what the A vector is. It's this guy right here. So we have M times minus G in the downward direction. So that is the weight vector. It equals the object's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. That's its magnitude, and its direction is straight down. A couple of things about this. One, let's talk about units, and the other, let's talk about this thing that we're calling mass. Let's do the mass first. I'm going to come back to this equation. But for now, let me solve this one, Newton's second law, for the acceleration. That tells me that acceleration equals the net force acting on an object divided by the mass. Now what is this mass? Mass is apparently, from this equation, some property that an object has that gives it the ability to resist accelerations, the ability to resist changes in its motion. The larger the mass for a given force, the smaller the acceleration. If m is small, you have a large acceleration. If m is big, you have a small acceleration. So the acceleration for a given force is inversely proportional to the mass. Mass is what gives objects a property we call inertia, the ability to resist accelerations, the ability to resist changes in their motion. Notice that it's a scalar. This thing doesn't have a direction associated with it. It is really just a measure of how much stuff you have in an object. The more stuff you have there for a given force, the less acceleration you'll have. So mass is a scalar. It just tells you how much stuff you have. In the SI system of units, we measure mass in the unit of kilograms. So kilograms tell you how much stuff you have, and it gives an object the property we call inertia. So now we can talk about units of the force. If the mass is measured in units of kilograms, acceleration, we know, is measured in meters per second squared, then forces have units of kilogram meter per second squared. We like to combine those units all together and call that a Newton. So when we talk about forces, the unit that we will use is capital N, which stands for Newton. A newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. 
A newton is the force it takes to accelerate one kilogram at one meter per second squared. That's a newton. Okay, so the weight vector. I'm going to write its magnitude here. Weight has a magnitude of mg, and we know that its direction is straight down. Before we leave this one, let me just point out one more thing that can be confusing. Mass is a constant. So long as you don't change how much stuff there is in your object, this won't change as you move the object from place to place, but g certainly can change. Suppose I take this ball and move it to the moon. It will have the same mass there. There's still the same amount of stuff inside the object, but the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is about one-sixth of what it is on the Earth. So its weight will have changed. It has the same mass, but if g changes, the weight changes. Weight is a vector. Its magnitude depends on two things, how much stuff you have, and what the acceleration due to gravity is. If you take an object somewhere else, the mass will stay the same, but g might change, so the weight might change. Okay, so that's the weight force. Let's talk now about tension. Let me erase this. And get that arrow back. Tension is the force that strings or ropes or chains or anything like that exerts on an object. Suppose we have a box here and I tie a string to it. So here's a string, right? And I want to drag this box along with this string. If I grab hold of this thing, that's my hand there, I grab it and I start walking this way, then the string exerts a force on the box to move it along. And the force that that string exerts is what we call tension. Most of the strings and ropes and chains that we'll encounter this semester are what we call ideal. And that means we're going to assume that the string is infinitely flexible and that it has no mass. So it's a massless string. It's infinitely flexible. It's a, quote, ideal string. And what this means is that tension remains the same all through it. So I'm going to say tension is constant and tension is parallel to the string. So tension acts straight along this direction and it doesn't change in magnitude. Ideal strings are massless, so tension has the same magnitude and it's always parallel to the string itself. All right. One thing about tension before we move on. Let's suppose we have a pulley. Looks like this. And there's a couple of boxes hanging off of it. Here's a large box. Because it's large, I'll call it capital M. And here's a little box, little m. If I am holding this system in place, so it's not going anywhere, and then suddenly let it go, what's going to happen is this box is going to fall, and this box is going to rise, because this one's heavier. Now, of the forces that act on this box and this box, one of them, I'm going to draw it in orange so we can see it, is the tension force. There's going to be an upward tension force on this guy and an upward tension force on this guy. If the string is ideal, meaning it's massless and infinitely flexible, and if the pulley has no mass, this tension will have the same magnitude all along this string. So whatever this tension is, this tension will have the exact same value. If this is pulling up with 2 newtons, this will pull up with 2 newtons. If it's pulling up with 10 newtons, this will be 10 newtons. So long as there is no mass along the way, that tension is not going to change. Late in the course, we will have pulleys that have mass to them. So maybe this would be mass of the pulley. Once you have mass along the way, these tensions will change. Tension is only constant if there's no mass along the way, if the string itself is massless, and if it doesn't encounter any mass. But if the pulley has mass, now the tension on each side can be different. It'll have one value over here. There's no mass along here. Hit some mass, the value changes, and there'll be a different value over here. That'll come up late in the course. But for now, 
we'll assume that the pulley has no mass, so it's an ideal pulley, and that means that tension has the same magnitude everywhere. Okay, tension is the force that strings or ropes or chains or anything like that exerts on something, and tension always pulls. It never pushes on an object. Always pulls. As they say, you can't push on a rope. You can only pull on a rope. That's the tension force. Let's talk now about the normal force. This one has shown up, although we haven't named it, in a couple of the previous talks. Here's the cases where, here's a couple of cases where it showed up. We had a table with an apple resting on it. So here was the apple, all right? And I also talked about a case where there was a wall and my finger was going to press on the wall. Right, so there was my finger pressing into the wall. There's a normal force in both of those cases. The normal force is one of the sort of magical forces that we encounter this semester. It's magic in the sense that it shows up wherever and whenever it needs to, to keep two solid objects from moving through each other. And it takes any value it needs to, to accomplish that. The normal force is what's responsible for keeping this apple from falling through the table. As this apple is sitting here, the table exerts a force on it straight up. It's the force exerted by the table on the apple. But we're going to call it a normal force because the apple is a solid object and the table is a solid object. And this is the force that one solid object is exerting on another to keep it from moving through itself. Same thing is going on here. Here's a solid object, the wall. Another solid object, my finger, is trying to move through it. A normal force shows up and stops that from happening. Let me draw it in red here. The wall is going to exert a force on my finger. It's going to be this way, stopping my finger from moving ghost-like through that wall. Normal force shows up whenever and wherever it needs to, and it takes any value it needs to to keep two solid objects from moving through each other. As I'm talking to you, I'm sitting on a chair. And there's a normal force acting on my tail end that is pushing me up, keeping me from falling through the chair. If I stand up, there will be a normal force on my feet, keeping my feet from falling through the floor. There's all kinds of normal forces all around us. As you look around, if you see one solid object in contact with another solid object, there's going to be a normal force there. I have a coffee cup sitting on my desk. So here's my coffee cup, All right? It looks like this. There's my coffee cup. There's a normal force on that coffee cup that is responsible for keeping the coffee cup from falling straight through the table. And it looks like this. It's going to go straight up and it's going to take any value it needs to. I'm going to call it N sub C, the normal force on the coffee cup. It'll take any value it needs to, to keep that cup from falling through the table. Suppose we have a ramp an inclined plane at some angle theta and there's a box resting on it box has mass m the box cannot fall through this ramp these are two solid objects so there'll be a normal force that shows up to stop the box from falling ghost-like through the ramp now what direction is that normal force going to be in the word normal in the context of math means perpendicular and that is there to tell us what the direction of the normal force is. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface that's exerting it. So there's the normal force, it's perpendicular to the ramp. If I move this ramp up and down, steeper or less steep, the normal force will adjust with it so that it's always perpendicular to this surface. A couple of things about the normal force. It's always perpendicular and it takes any value it needs to to keep two solid objects from moving through each other. I'm looking around my desk and I'm seeing so many things resting on the desk. Each one has a normal force on it and each of them has a different value. The normal force is kind of magical in that it can take any value it needs to, whenever it needs to, to keep solid objects from moving through each other. Kind of amazing. Now how does the normal force do this? Before we move on, let me just give you a quick description of how the normal force does it. 
And let me do it by focusing our attention on this point right here where my finger is trying to pass through the wall. A normal force shows up and stops that. How does the normal force do that? Let's zoom in on this so we take kind of a microscopic level look at it. The wall, even though it looks like a continuous object, if you zoom in close enough, you find out that the wall is made of a bunch of atoms and molecules bound together by chemical bonds. So they look something like this, right? So here's the wall, and these might be carbon atoms, or you know, who knows what. It depends what the wall is made of. But this is what the wall is going to look like on a microscopic level. Now here comes my finger. Although it also looks like a continuous object, if you zoom in close enough, you'll find that it too is made of atoms and molecules bound together by chemical bonds. But the important thing is that these atoms and molecules have bonds between them that, unless we break the object, can't be severed. So that when I take this solid object, my finger, and move it towards this one, as soon as they come close to being in contact, these chemical bonds can flex and deflect. I can bend the object, maybe, but I'm not going to break it. I can't pass these through here. That's the nature of the normal force. It shows up as a macroscopic, as a large-scale force. But in essence, it has to do with the small-scale chemistry and electromagnetic forces in between the atoms and molecules that are binding the two solid objects together. So that's where the normal force comes from. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit about this last one, this friction force. And we'll say more about that one in a couple of lectures down the line. Suppose this uh, box here is at rest on this ramp. It's not going anywhere. We know from our intuition that there's got to be something that's keeping it from sliding down the ramp. If the box is stationary, there's got to be something pushing it up the ramp. And in this case, the force that's doing that is the friction force. I'm going to draw it here, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Friction, I'm going to call it lowercase f. In the same way that the normal force is kind of magical, in that it takes any value and it shows up whenever it needs to, to keep solid objects from moving through each other, the friction force is also kind of magical. It shows up wherever it needs to, and it can take whatever value up to some maximum it needs to, to keep two objects at rest relative to each other, or if they're moving, to bring them to rest. Here's a case where this is at rest, this surface is at rest relative to this surface, friction is going to try to keep them at rest. In the absence of friction, if this was a slippery surface, this box would slide down the ramp. Friction is going to oppose that and push up. So long as friction is able to push hard enough to accomplish that, this box will stay at rest on this ramp. That's the job of friction in this case, to keep this surface of the box at rest relative to this surface. Another example of friction is if I took my coffee mug and I slid it across the table this way. So I gave it a velocity v. In that case, friction would oppose that sliding motion and try to bring these two surfaces to rest relative to each other. So if my coffee cup was sliding this way, a friction force would show up and it would push backwards this way on my coffee mug and try to bring it to rest. Whereas the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. The friction force is always parallel to the surface. We'll talk about its magnitude and the limits on how hard friction can push in a couple of lectures down the line. But for now, just note that friction is there to do one of two things. To keep objects at rest relative to each other, or if they're sliding, to bring them to rest. And friction always acts parallel to the surface, whereas the normal force always acts perpendicular to the surface. All right, we'll come back and talk more about friction later, but for now, those are our four named forces. We have weight, which is the force of gravity. We have tension, exerted by strings and ropes and chains and that kind of thing. So long as the string is ideal, infinitely flexible, and has no mass, tension has the same magnitude everywhere along the string, and it always pulls and never pushes. The normal force is responsible for stopping ghost-like behavior. It keeps two solid objects from moving through each other. 
It shows up wherever it needs to, whenever it needs to, and it takes any value it needs to to keep solid objects from moving through each other. The friction is another sort of magical force. Its job is to keep two surfaces at rest relative to each other, or if they're sliding, to bring them to rest. More details on that one in a couple of lectures. All right, now let's move into talking about Newton's second law and free body diagrams.